run, party, repeat. Welcome to the East Coast Adventures Dirt and Vert Podcast, where we talk all things running, racing, and training to help you get ready for your next big adventure. Learn from our successes and our failures and have fun at the same time. Join us right here every week with inspiring guests who share their captivating tales from the trails. And remember, nobody cares. Run faster. All right. Welcome back. This is the Dirt and Vert Podcast. I'm David. And I'm Matt. And we have a guest with us today that most people are probably going to recognize the name, um, especially around the East. But Greg Armstrong, very talented runner. Uh, Greg has a just a decorated list of races that he's ran and podiumed or, you know, I believe at one point uh, Greg's even ran for Team USA for the 24 hour. Uh, Greg's got some pretty notable races behind his belt, too, uh, Vol State being a, a big one. Greg was one of the people that inspired me to want to run Vol State. Uh, he was the first one that kind of got the thought in my head, and then one of our buddies did it, and that kind of pushed me over. But uh, Greg, Greg had a really funny story that he told uh, which was when you were sleeping against the stop sign, Greg. Yeah. And uh, someone left you money in a sandwich. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That actually happened twice in Vol State. I was mistaken as for a homeless person. Yeah. But uh, Greg was, was one of the, you know, Greg ran that entire race in sandals and actually won the race, uh, set the record for a while and was king of the, was it king of the road? Is that what they call it? What they call it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, huge congratulations. And Greg's just a remarkable person, too. But Greg, if you don't care, will you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into running? Sure. Uh, my name's Greg Armstrong. And, you know, it's I've been running, I guess, my whole life. You know, my dad was kind of part of that late 70s, early 80s, you know, you know, running craze. We'd go out in the neighborhood and run a couple of miles. And I remember just as a as a you know, seven or eight year old, I'd go out and he'd let me run a mile with him. And, you know, so it's always been just embedded in, in my life. Um, you know, ran cross country in high school, you know, moderately talented, not anything, you know, e exceptional. Uh, but I, you know, I always ran for fitness, didn't do anything competitive in my twenties or maybe early thirties. And then got into doing uh, Ironman triathlons for a couple of years and, did that, um, enjoyed it, but just kind of the scene was just really not my, not, not my vibe, you might say. Um, and I think it was 2007, 2007, I did the Louisville Ironman and I had, um, signed up for Arkansas Traveler was my first 100. And I did that in October and I was hooked, you know, so that, you know, ultra running just really fit fit my personality. I love the community. You know, it's, you have this really unique sense of you can be extremely competitive and want to win the race, but at the same time, you know, you want the best for your, you know, your, your, your competitor and you have this camaraderie that's being built. And I didn't, I didn't sense that as much in the Ironman circuit or in some of the other um, races that I've been a part of. And then I guess just, the longer the event, you know, my full, I'm a coach. I've been a cross country coach for high school students and middle school students for 20 years. And I think, you know, what I tell them that the longer the event, the less, you know, your God given ability is a factor. And the more that, you know, that, that grit and that mental toughness plays into a factor. So, um, you know, I may not have just that raw genetic talent, but, um, I, I found that, I guess kind of found my niche in the longer events where the mental toughness kind of became more of a factor. So, um, yeah, that, that's a little bit about my running past and where I am today. I, I've always had the Arkansas traveler on my bucket list because I've always thought that was a really good race. I still want to run it at some point. How did you like it? Like, I, I guess it had to be pretty good for it to get you hooked. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's so it's interesting. I, you know, I'm sure if you've been running a while, those those first ultras, just, it's hard to go. You know, you go back and you think how you perceived it and how you looked at it. I mean, you know, I loved it. It was great. It was a great mixture. You know, at that time in 2007, there were only a handful. Mm -hmm. I think that was a year there were some wildfires, and you know, that was 
you know, what the big four in the summer the that they used to have. I forgot what they call that series where, you know, they had, and I think Western States maybe was canceled. And so Arkansas Traveler became that, you know, that was the big deal back then. If you did all four of these hundred milers in the summer, I mean, you, that was like legit. Right. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a good mixture of some single track, a lot of Jeep roads, you know, a lot of like forest service roads, which, which I like that. I love, I love single track, but especially in a hundred, I love to get on, you know, some Jeep roads and some gravel roads or double track to where you can kind of relax a little bit. You don't have to concentrate as much. Um, so it, it is a mixture that it's definitely not, I would say that's the majority of the race is just really scenic. It's in the Ozarks kind of West Arkansas. So yeah, it's a great, great. And it's, it's point. Is it point to point? So. Yeah, yeah, kind of. No, it it's a it's a loop. Well, I mean, this is 2007. They may have changed the course. It kind of <laughs> meanders. Yeah, I mean, it was a long time ago. Um, but it's it kind of meanders. But I think you finish where you started, or at least I did. If what I can remember. What the interesting story. Of course, you know, you you know so little about you know what to do and how to do. It. Especially back then, there was not a lot of resources, and so my wife. I think, you know, we had our children were really young. I think my youngest was only like one or two. So she, I wasn't going to ask her to go out and crew for me. So I actually got four of my students. I teach high school science. And these guys were like, they just gotten their license. They were like maybe sophomores in high school. And I knew I need help driving back because I didn't <laughs> know how incapacitated I would be. So I had four of my students riding with me. We camped out, kind of made it into this cool trip going out there. Um, and I was running the race and they were pacing me. They were my cross country runners. And one of them was supposed to run the last 13 miles with me. And it was, I mean, of course, this was, I think I finished like barely under 24 hours. So it was like 23 hours and something. And then like, I'm so used to, I love, I'm, I, I run in the cold. I don't mind, you know, at that point, but I'd never taken myself to that fatigue state. And in the temperatures this is in October. So the temperatures dropped to uh, maybe in the forties and I was still moving pretty good at mile 85. I get to an aid station at 87, I had 13 miles to go. Well, my 16 year old, he was, he was just tired. He couldn't run. And foolishly, I gave up my shirt and my water bottle. Like I just thought, and that was the last aid station. So I had 13 miles to go and I'm thinking I'm, I'm moving pretty good. I'm not cold. Um, I got to mile 89. I couldn't run or at least I didn't think I could run. You know how you, you know, you I probably looking back, I probably could have. There's like three Creek crossings that were waist deep. It was 45, 46 degrees. And I mean, I was getting hypothermia. I mean, it was, it was scary because I just could not, I couldn't run. I couldn't get my body heat up. Um, and then that, I don't know how long those last 13 miles took me, but I got dehydrated. So I crossed the finish line and I literally just passed out. And this was back in the day where, you know, most of your hundreds, they would weigh you and they had, you know, they had really good, it was, it was really interesting. They had a lot more medical help, I think back then than they do now. They had nurses, they had IVs. And so they carried me over to the medical tent, which was inside the lodge area. And there's my 16 year old students. They thought I was dead. They literally thought that I had died and they were going to have to call my wife and tell me, tell her that, you know, that I had, had passed away and they started crying. And then, you know, it was just this huge. And I'm just, I finally kind of come to, and um, I'll never forget this as long as I live. I'm laying there and there's two other men. There's a, a guy to my right and a guy to my left. And I guess their partner, their significant other, one of his, I don't know if it's his wife or his girlfriend, she's crying and she's like, honey, are you going to be okay? Is it, you know, and she's just, and, he, and we all look the same. We're just kind of that, you know, we're just laid out. We can't hardly respond. And then I look to my left and there's this guy laid out. And his wife is over him just like, you're a stupid idiot. What are you thinking? This is so dumb. And, you know, and the nurse asked, she's like, what would your life be like? I was like, she's going to be like this. You know, <laughs> this one over here. Gonna, um, so, yeah. And then they, I, I, I mean, I could not walk. They, I mean, I could shuffle 
I drive a big Suburban. So I had a little mat in the back of the Suburban. And then we make the drive back from, which is basically on the border of Oklahoma. And my students drive all, try to drive all the way back. We get in downtown Memphis and they get stuck in traffic. And one of the students is yelling at the other one that's driving. And he gets so mad, he throws it in park and gets out of the truck and just starts walking down the street in downtown Memphis. I can't do anything because I'm just incapacitated. And the, it was just, it was, it was definitely a, an, an epic first, first ultra for me, but it, is I'm guessing sub- you, oh, go ahead. Is that Suburban the, the same one you still have now? Oh yeah. It's a part of the family. It just it's can't. Something, I saw that at a uh, mid state a couple years ago where you, yeah. you parked it and you walked it through. Wow. Yeah. That thing's, that thing's a beast and it's lasting that long. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love his front bumper. That's the best. <laughs> I bet that front bumper weighs a couple hundred pounds, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess the uh, those students didn't ever come back to volunteer to bring you back from a race. <laughs> Actually, I think they, yeah, they, they, uh, one of them came back and crewed for me at um, Georgia Jewel. I ran Georgia Jewel 100 the very first year. I think that was 11, maybe. Uh, maybe, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yep. Yep. 2011. Yep. Um, yeah, they they crewed for me multiple times. I think one of them even came out to Ball State early on when I did just a. So yeah, they 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 still came back, but I knew a little bit more about. Well, I don't I don't know if we have time, but my second ultra, again, I this is not advisable, but I didn't know what I was doing. Right, my second <laughs> ultra is when I started my nonprofit Run for Water. My goal was to run from the Alabama state line to the Kentucky state line, there's a highway, it's called Highway 231, that just goes straight up. It, it just cuts the middle, of, it's the middle of Tennessee. It goes through Chevyville, Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro is the geographic center of, of our state. And so this highway goes all the way to Kentucky. It's 120 miles. My goal was to do it under 24 hours, kind of a self-supported, you know, type run. Um, but I'm trying to think about how can I get really efficient? So you you mentioned the bumper of, we call the, we affectionately call my suburban, the buckskin bus because the official Chevrolet color is buckskin. And my wife unaffectionately calls it BS because you you know, but anyhow, so the buckskin, I thought this would be a great idea. I would put a cooler. I could put two coolers on the front of that big bumper, right? And then I got some of my students, they were going to follow me the entire way in the right-hand lane just to keep traffic off of me. And then when if I wanted something to drink, I would just turn around and get something out of the cooler and I could just keep moving. That was that was my logic, right? I didn't think about the fact that I'm asking some 16, 17-year-old boys to drive five miles an hour for 120 <laughs> miles. <laughs> We're, I don't know if you've ever been south of Chevyville, but there's a Chestnut Ridge. There's this, this kind of really hilly. This is, And this was like the beginning of the race. We're only like 20 miles in. And first off, they would they would drive and then they would hit me at times just lightly. But, you know, I'm like, if they just hit the gas, I'm, I'm a goner. <laughs> and then at one point they were driving and I hear like metal against metal. Well, apparently one of them needed to take a leak. So he opened up the passenger door so he could do his business. And the driver thought it would be funny to like run the door into the guardrail to kind of knock him a little, you know, just kind of that thought that would be funny. And I'm yelling at him because I'm trying to run this ultra and they're, they're goofing off in the truck. They dent my truck. And of course, and then there's urine all in the front seat because he, Holy yeah, was, cow. yeah. So, <laughs> and, um, so that was, that was actually story, the never. start of run for water. I was trying to just raise awareness for one water system. I really wasn't trying to start a nonprofit. I just wanted to raise money and raise awareness about the water crisis. And so I reached out to the papers and just told them what I was doing in all those towns that I ran through in Chevable. And that would, this would have been, March of 2010, um, to continue that story, I, I ran um, Sterling Gym that year in May, and I'm jogging. I think it's like, it was like, I mean, there's not really an aid station, but, you know, back then, well, 
I think they have, I think Derb has eight stations now. Back then, Laz would just put jugs of water on the, on the course. But I'm passing by and I'm stopped to get this jug of water. And this was my first introduction. I'd never heard of Laz at that point. He wasn't the household ultra name that he is now. Um, and I see this old crotchety guy with a beard and he's like, are you that, are you that guy that claimed that he was the first person to run from the Alabama state line to the Kentucky state line? I said, no, sir. I said, I never made that claim that the, the paper took that liberty in Cheville. They made that claim. I never said that. He's like, well, I just need you to know that I was doing that back when you were in diapers, you know? And so apparently <laughs> according to Laz, that was the original Vol state course that I, that no, I ran really back in the seventies. He said that all of his, you know, like, um, Ray K and, um, Doyle Carpenter and all those studs that are still out there getting it now. Right. You know, back in the late seventies, they would get together. Laz said, I mean, I'm sure I don't want to misquote him, but I think that he said a couple of times, you know, they'd make it to Murfreesboro and then they would go into a bar and then that was the end of the journey. Cause they, you know, they wouldn't, wouldn't make it any further, but every now and then they would make it all the way. That's funny. Yeah. That, that sounds like the most dangerous race you've ever done. May, maybe it may. Uh, that's very, very possible. Very what did possible. you do when they tapped you with the car? I yelled at them and, and I said, okay, I need, I need five, at least five feet. And so, but I, I guess overall they did really good. We had to work out some kinks that first 20, 30 miles. But after that, they kind of got in a rhythm and it was, it, it worked. You know, so. how, how mad were you when you realized that was your door against the guardrail? <laughs> oh, that that's the reverse. I mean, it just adds character. I really I was just mad that they were goofing off more so than there was the dent. And I was probably more upset that there was urine inside of the. In, yeah. The front, yeah. In the dent. Like, I mean, you know. But that brings up a whole new term for run for water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah sure. Whole new meaning. <laughs> So that was like your your inaugural inaugural race for raising money. That was like your very first one. Yeah. And like I said, I just I just wanted to. It was really just I called that event Run for Water just to raise money for a water system we were doing in in Honduras. That was just a kind of a one off, and then it just it just evolved really slowly and organically from there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. What. What made you, well, we can ask that later. I, yeah. I won't get into that. I won't, I won't go off to the side. Um, so when you were talking about part of the four, wasn't Umstead one of those? I don't, I'm trying I don't to remember. Know. I do remember people talking about the four races cause they were like, you know, some, yeah. I think there's still like this discussion of who was the, like the original, right. you know, the original 100. Cause I think like some of them get slam, there. Yeah. Or was there yeah, one the called Grand, yeah, it was Old, a Dominion, Grand Slam. Maybe? Old Dominion? Um, Old Dominion might have been one, right? right. State, I think Lawrence it was. Yeah, that's, did that's you do all four of them? No, I didn't. I know. I, I do remember that. It's, it was called the Grand Slam, and it was all through the summer. I don't think Umstead was one, and I think Old Dominion may have been. I know, what, obviously, Western State was one. And definitely Arkansas Traveler, I think was well. Was, I don't. I, I don't think Arkansas Traveler was typically a part of the Grand Slam, but that one year it replaced it because of the wildfires. Oh, uh, I don't. I, and gotcha. I, I, I want to say it was. I, I don't quote me on that. I think it may have been Western States that was canceled because of wildfires. So they picked up Old Dominion. I mean, excuse me. They picked up Arkansas Traveler as the last race of the Grand Slam. I think what it says here is it says uh, Old Dominion, Western States, Vermont 100, yep. Leadville, and Wasatch. Okay. Um, I'm sure it's probably changed over yeah, the Yeah, I'm sure it has. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That's pretty cool, though. And, and you know, that's, that's actually pretty amazing that your very first 100-miler, you go out and run less than 24 hours, too. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, and it's so weird too. Like back then, there was just—I don't know. I mean, there wasn't—you didn't. I didn't I get even then. I—I I think I got ninth place, maybe, but it didn't register. I don't know. Maybe it was a lot. I can't remember exactly. Don't quote me on that. But I—I I don't know. Back then, there was not this, and I don't want to get into the philosophy aspect too too deep. But you know, I love the fact that our sport has grown, right? Mm -hmm. But all, there's just I mean, 
I love the fact that I entered the sport where you did epic stuff and you just, you didn't talk about it and there wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of attention for it. Right. I mean, there's something that's kind of pure about that, that, uh, that I kind of miss a little bit now, you know, and like I said, I love the fact that more people are introduced to the sport. It's more, it's more common. Um, but you know, I, I just, you're right. I mean, I, I feel, but I didn't recognize that that was a significant accomplishment. You know, as far as like, it was, I had a pivotal moment in 2013. So I think I ran Ar Arkansas Traveler. I did, um, you know, my own event, which wouldn't be on, you know, any register, the 120. I think I did that in 23 hours and one minute, I think it was, which was in and of itself was pretty impressive. I mean, it's a relatively mm -hmm. hilly grind for 120 miles. Uh, I did. The, you know, the uh, Georgia Jewel, it Umstead somewhere in there. I can't remember when that was. One of my favorite races, it was a one and done. It was called the Gut Reactor in northern <laughs> Georgia. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but no. Mm. It, had, it was like a torrential downpour on these horse trails, which horse trails are fine, but when it's raining, I think only five people finished the 100 miler. It was... I mean, it, I mean, it was, it was rough. I had some kind of nerd. I had mud in my shoes back then. I wore shoes. I didn't wear sandals. And I had, I did something in my toe. I had like nerve damage in my toe for months. I couldn't feel one of my toes. It was just a, but look it up. It's called the gut reactor. It was, there the was some Georgia, Georgia ultra and trail running society guts yeah. GR 100. Yes. yes. Yeah, you're right. It was one and done. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was an awesome race and it was a, on great trail systems, but I think the fact that it rained so much, you know, people complained and they did, you know, it just didn't get the traction because they had horrible weather that year. Um, yeah. And, you know, in all those races, I, I think I remember I was so mad at, um, I think the um, Georgia Jewel was the first race that it, it took me over 24 hours and it was long that first year because they marked it it was it was a little long and oh, i mean i remember i was so upset because i couldn't get under 24 hours but anyhow um 2013 i ran uh teton 100 it was lisa batch and smith put on that race man that oh, i wish that race would come back that is a phenomenal if you like a road course that point to point with just incredible views you're looking at the tetons off to your left and you know up to that point i just i didn't see myself as you know just one of the a great you know i mean i would get top three in some of these smaller races you know it's just your own my own self-perception i think i was better than i gave myself credit for but in that race you know i started off pretty conservative at mile 50 i caught caught up with connie gardner which if you know connie gardner in 2013 she was a beast and she was like, I remember she was so mad. I mean, she was so competitive. She's one of those individuals like in the middle of the race, she was not that friendly, you know, because she was, just, <laughs> she did not want anybody passing her, which I love it though, but she is an incredible person. And mile 87, I caught up to Grant. I can't ever pronounce his last name, the Australian. And he had just, yeah. he had just got maybe third in Badwater that year. And then at mile 97, I caught up to Oswaldo Lopez, who had, this race was in October. I think he, I don't know if he won Badwater or he was second that year. So, I mean, he was at his prom. And I mean, and I'm like, I, at that point, I'm starstruck. I'm like, I'm running with the big dogs, you know? And like, it's just, <laughs> and Oswaldo Lopez and I ran, this, this would have been maybe the second week in, yeah, it was the second Saturday in October, 2013 we're running neck and neck and, you know, and I catch up, you know, and his, his, um, drink of choice was beer with salt. And so I catch up to him and, and he's so friendly. We have this huge embrace. Like he embraces me. I'm, you know, I'm trying to beat him and he embraces me, offers me a beer from his crew. And then we go back to running and then it's, and then it's kind of that, that chess match, you know, like he tries to pull ahead of me to try to, you know, we're at mile 98 he tries to break me, you know, and then I, I stay with him. Then we kind of settle back into a pace. Um, and then, you know, once he sees that he can't break me, 
he stops and gives me another embrace of encouragement. And then we're running along and then, okay, I'm, I try to break him. I try to pick up the pace. He stays with me. It's like a 50 yard dash for a hundred mile race. Lisa Batchin Smith, she's like in tears because it's this epic finish. I think he beat me by 13, 15 seconds, something like that. Oh, wow. But I was just like, man. And after at the award ceremony the next day, Connie Gardner came up to me and she's like, Greg, you got talent. I mean, you, you're running with some elite runners. And I'm like, really? Like, she's like, you need to do the 24 hour event, the national championship. And I'm like, okay, well, when is it? She's like, it's two weeks from now. And, you know, and I was still in that <laughs> mentality of, when I did a hundred miler, I was, I was taking like two months off. I got to recover. I'm like, there's no way. She's like, Oh no, you'll be fine. You know, two weeks is plenty of time. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, I, I just don't, I can't, I, I can't run my best in two weeks. And, but you know, you don't, you can't disagree with Connie Gardner. I mean, with her, <laughs> you know, so the, the, that, that year, the 24 hour national championship was um, in Oklahoma. And so oh, right outside of Oklahoma city. So I went and um, kind of gutted it out with John cash. I think it was like maybe 140. I don't, I can't remember 140 something miles. Uh, I got second The in the, the first place runner was an auto spot on the team. Uh, that that's how the national championship works. And the coach Howard Nippert was there and you know, and I typically start pretty conservative. So like, you know, that's just kind of how I've always run my races, try to even split as best as possible and then pick it up at the end. And, and he kind of, I guess I kind of got his attention. He's like, oh, you need to stick with this. I'd say you can make the team. You know, this is my, this, that was my first 24 hour race. Um, and so I kind of got on that, that kind of, that became my focus. I wanted to make the U S 24 hour ultra team. Um, and I earned it. I mean, I have to say like, you know, these guys, but I, not that I'm envious, you know, there's guys that go out their first 24 hour and they qualify for the team. I think it took me, I want to say I ran in that next year, maybe year and a half, 10. I'm just kind oh, of wow. 10, 24 hour races and every one of them, that was my goal is to break into that top six. They take the top six men in the nation, the top six women, um, and it took me all of, you know, it, it took me that next year, I think in September, I hit 145 miles and that put me in the sixth spot. And then, uh, the last qualifying race was in somewhere in Florida. It was on a track. Uh, I can't remember maybe Tallahassee. I can't remember the, um, this would have been early January, 2015. Pensacola. And Pensacola. Yeah. Pensacola 100. Wild, Wildcat Ultra. Yeah. 24 and, hours. And Joe, Joe Feggy was, was trying to make the team. And of course he, at that time he was a stud. And so I'm, I'm just going there to, to, to race, to prevent, you know, like I'm, I'm actually the sixth person, but I don't want to just sit at home and watch that race unfold and somebody knock me out. I want to be in the hunt. And so, yeah. I mean, we're going at it. I mean, we're just, cause I'm trying to keep pace with him. I'm trying to be conservative, but also keep, keep him, you know, it's, it's, it's so strategic. Um, and, um, but yeah, I made, I made, made, barely made the team. I made it, you know, the sixth man. So that was an awesome experience. Perfect time for my family. My youngest was like, I think 10, my oldest was like 14. So we took this, 10 day family trip to Italy and the end of it was you got to run in a world championship 24 hour race representing your country which was incredible that is awesome yeah. I remember watching a video and I think it's you and Harvey after a race <laughs> and you both had ran for I guess you were you were both still wearing like your team USA stuff but you were both it was so funny you were both doing that 100 mile hobble <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and I was looking, I was like, that's funny. That's really funny. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome that, you know, that, that became your focus and that you hit it because I attempted it one time, you know, I just wanted to go run on the track and I actually, you know, me and mm -hmm. you talked for a couple hours, you know, just yeah. for me to understand what to do. And, <laughs> and as soon as I got a hundred miles, I was like, I'm done. 
yeah. I think I was like 20, 21 hours in. I think you ran the race too, if I remember yeah. right. Like you yeah. were at the Stinger. And uh, I was just like, no, nope, I'm done. And it was funny, like 22 or 23 hours in, Matt's calling. Dude, get up. Get up. Just go run some more miles. I'm like, trying to get him up. I'm like, I'm done, man. I'm like, dude, these people are quitting. You could like keep moving up in spots. And he's yeah. like, nope. And then the next year I went and did it. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. Yep. As soon as I hit that hundred miles, I'm like, I'm done with this. Yeah. I do want to try it again at some point, but it's just not, it's not really on my list right now. No. I, I, I want to try some other things. And it, it was, I mean, to run a track for 24 hours, that is, you have to be so patient and consistent you know like there is no there is no making up time you know the people that go out and try to run really fast in the beginning it just you just blow up mm -hmm. um it's really like you said it's very strategic yeah and and if you start racing somebody uh oh. you both are going to blow up yep All right. <laughs> well my favorite my favorite 24 hour race and it, it's my, it's still my, it's my PR to this point, to this, to this day was, um, 2018 desert solstice, which is, you know, it's kind of an invitation only to try to get the, you know, the elite of the elite out there. And again, I'm trying to, trying to make the U S team again. I didn't, I didn't qualify for the team in 2017. It's every two years. So I was there in 2015. Um, I didn't make the team in 2017. Um, so I'm trying to get back on the team in 2018 for the 2019 championship in Albi, France. And that's where the video for, with me and Harvey. And so I'm at Desert Solstice. And that's where Camille broke the world record the first time. So you're and what I love about the track races, especially the competitive ones, you see everybody's race unfold. Right. I mean, and, and that was the year that Pat Reagan was trying to break into the 24 hour race and Zach Bitter which Zach Bitter had the U.S. record in the 100 mile. And, in, in, you know, any other time, that if I had not had like 15, 24-hour races under my belt, it would have been so demoralizing. I'm just getting lapped by Zach and Pat. And if you've ever seen Pat Reagan run, it is like, it's, a, it's, it's beautiful. Like his stride is just effortless. He's just kind of, and, you know, and I'm laboring along and, but at that point, I was mature enough to like, I'm doing my thing. You know, I, I know what my body can do. I know what my pace needs to be, you know, you, you know, and they're just, they're, they're just lapping me. And I think it, I don't know, 12 hours in, I think I'm in like, there's only 30 runners. I think I'm in 22nd, 23rd place, <laughs> you know, like, but I'm, I'm hitting my, I'm hitting my marks. Bob Hearn was there and, you know, and he's, he's. You know, I mean, he is just super paced too. Um, and so we're running along and, I, you know, and I, and this was the last, I think this was the last, the last race to qualify. So you knew all, you knew, you knew exactly where you needed to be to be six, the sixth person mm -hmm. to make the team. Right. I, I take that back. I don't think it was the last race, but it was close to the last race. Um, so, you know, you, you knew who you needed to be, you knew what place you needed to be in. Um, and so, I'm running and I think I'm competing against Bob Hearn. And so I'm trying, you know, I'm watching his, his splits and I know he's super consistent. He's not going to slow down at the end of the race. He's going to have even splits, but I'd built up a decent lead and I wasn't thinking about Nick Curry. He wasn't really on my radar um, until like 22 hours in. And I'm kind of at that point pacing for like 152 miles, which would have been my PR. I'm thinking, Oh man, this is good. I'm going to make the team. And then I start, seeing nick curry he starts lapping me and i'm like what's he doing and then i'm like and i look at his i'm like i'm doing the math because you got to do the, you got to crunch the numbers right because mm -hmm. like you said if you start racing too early you're going to crash and burn yep. and i'm like oh no you know and he's from um phoenix right and so the the sun comes up and people are watching it he's a hometown boy crowd favorite the track like half the track is lined with his his friends you know and i mean they've got like he's got this huge cheering section and they're coming out cheering him on because if he can beat me he's on the team right so he's gonna he's gonna and so and then i had you know i think i had like maybe one or two people maybe that were pulling for me and they would go on the other side of the track and like Kirk, you gotta go and i and so <laughs> i just i told myself i'm gonna wait until 
I'm a half a lap above him, ahead of him, right? Because I knew if, it, you know, I did the math. If he keeps running that pace and I keep running my pace, he's going to beat me. And he knew that. He was crunching the numbers too. And I said, I'm going to wait whenever that is, whenever he's a half, whenever I'm at the 50-yard line on one side of the track at the football field and he's on the other, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put the gas on and I'm going to go as much as I can and just let, let the chips fall where they may. And it was 25 and he was, I remember looking at his pace and I couldn't believe it. He was running. I know it was a sub seven minute mile, right? At towards the end to, to catch me. I mean, and he's, he's got some, he's, he's quick. He's definitely got some speed and he got a, he got a half a lot back and, I just turned it, turned it loose. It was the most epic race. I think I ran 155.1. He wow. ran, I think, if I remember right, 155.065, which equates oh, to like wow. 150 feet. Like, I, I mean, and it was, you know, he, it was just when I was just praying for that gun to go off to end the race. <laughs> Cause I was just, I kept looking, I mean, I was running scared, but I, you know, I never would have eclipsed 155 miles. I mean, there's, it, and if you'd have told me I could have run that, that fast, I don't think I ever broke a seven minute mile, but I was, I was probably doing seven thirties, seven fifteen. If you'd have told me before that, that it was even humanly possible for me to run a seven fifteen mile at the end of a 24 hour race. I was like, I you, physically, I couldn't do it, but you know, and of course the same thing, like we just, at the end, he just, we embraced and we had this amazing camaraderie because we both got the best out of one another. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about our sport is you can do that. And yet, you know, there's still, there is that competitive spirit, which I love, but it's not an animosity towards your competitor. Right. Yeah. What well, did, did 155 miles though, was that probably not the best in the country at that point? Oh no, I was still sixth. I mean, that's how that's how more that's how competitive the twenty four hour has gotten. I was still six man, and I made at it by fifty five miles. Yeah, and I made it by like two hundred feet. Like I mean, it was just, um, yeah. So oh, that is crazy. I don't. Is, is it still that competitive? Uh, well, you know. What's interesting about the evolution, the 24 hour, that used to be like, I mean, I would say I'm just, it really gained a lot of popularity maybe in the early teens, 2012, you know, Mike Morton, um, you know, broke the world record. He's an incredible runner. Um, your, all your backyard events have kind of, I think it's gotten a little less popular in the U S I think in the, in Europe, it's always been a much more popular event in Europe, your multi-day races, like around a track or a circuit that's always been. So, um, but yeah, 2000, I mean, what's the, I, can't, I never can pronounce his name. You know, he, that, that broke Giannis, Giannis's record in the 24 hour. He's approaching 200 miles, which is, this is like mind boggling the fact that somebody yes. ran 200 miles in 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. crazy. He won the I world championship in Albi that year. That's insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 200 miles. I mean, 155 is pretty, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Um, but again, if you didn't have him chasing you, you would probably have never done that. So Not that's pretty enough. awesome. And that's, that's your, still your best to date. It is. Yeah. That's, that's that's my best. Yeah, and it's so it's such a it, like I said, it's such a chess match. The uh, I did so many races, and I started off pacing for 160. Like that was, and I I, I never I wouldn't call it a crash and burn, but I would I, I just I kind of crashed, and I would land or somewhere around 145, 147. Never could break 150. The first race where I I, I did not pace for 160. I paced for like 157. I got 151 miles. All right, you got. I mean, just that. It's just. It's kind of like a marathon in a sense. You don't think of it, but you know, a marathon. If you go out five, six seconds too fast per mile, then what your yeah. body's. You gotta. You gotta find that. That's what I. That's I love that. You know that 
that calculation and the math and learning your body. And, you know, we all have our, our peak, right? You know, yep. we know we got you and figuring out what you can run. And the, the awesome thing about a track, which I know people think, how can you run six? It was 635 laps around a track. You remove every variable other than just raw running. It condenses it down. There's no elevation. There's food, especially you go to desert solstice in December. Weather's going to be perfect every year. And so there's, and I know that we love, I love all the variables of a mountain race where you got to carry your gear. Vol State, you don't know if it's going to be a dog or a tractor trailer or (laughs) chiggers or whatever else, you (laughs) you know, a beer bottle thrown at you or whatever. But when you can remove every variable, right? Because yeah. like, you know, like Stinger was cold, you still had the cold. But Desert Solstice, you've removed every variable. It's just running, in you, and that there's something that is really intriguing about that. If that makes sense, like yeah, if you yeah. Don't worry about yeah. food. You got food every every quarter of a mile. If you're not going to get dehydrated. You're not going to get cold if you you know you put on a jacket. So um, yeah, all you all you got to do is run. Just run. That's right. That's it. But you're you're the one thing you said though is exactly right just being five or six seconds off per mile can extremely just blow you up at the end Mm -hmm. if you make it to the end yes Uh, but five or six seconds you don't think it's that much but over Mm -hmm. 50 to 100 miles it starts to add up and it will you will blow up you're exactly right Mm -hmm. took me a long time to learn that (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. And sometimes Still. we forget, even though after we learn the lesson, I'm telling yep. you, I think there's early on, if I would perform really well at a race, you know, you do really well, you, you the next race, I always did better when, after I po- performed a little poorly because I, yes. I, I really just analyzed so much more and I went into it with a, a more humble confidence, right? And just, yep. you know, I was just so, talking about that not too long ago. I got a big dose of humble pie not too long ago. And when that <laughs> happens, it definitely brings you back to, you know, make sure you're training right. You're focused yeah. on the right things. You're doing what you need to. And especially in your next race, you don't forget what happened in that <laughs> last race. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you may forget it three races from now, but you will yeah. not forget it in that next race. Yeah. Speaking of uh, pie, uh, Barkley, now that will, that was my humble, I mean, Oh, I can't imagine. Yeah. I love what I love what Relaz said. Whenever um, I didn't, ma- I missed like the cutoff by like two minutes. Um, and he he said he's like, I bet you've never missed a cutoff before, have you, Armstrong? That was his comment. Oh, uh, no. and just with that <laughs> sadistic laugh, right? You know, that he, that while laugh. while he's smoking a cigarette, <laughs> yeah, and blowing it in your face, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you done Barkley? Uh twice. And what's the what's the furthest you've made it? I, I mean I did get all the books, but I missed the cutoff on the first lap both times. You know, just getting lost. You know, it it's it's just hard to even I just it's 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 just hard to even describe what that event is like. Yeah. And what it does I, to your body. <laughs> I was going to say, I did the Barkley Fall Challenge and, or, you know, Barkley Fall Classic. Yeah. And that's the only thing I've ever done. And, and that in itself is hard enough. I can't imagine going and trying to find a book. Yeah. Every, you know, you know, all the way around that course and then trying to make it back in time. And, and I'm terrible with navigation anyways. Like that yeah. is not my strong point. No. <laughs> they would find me in another state probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Greg, let's let's switch gears a little bit now and talk about you know you you alluded earlier about run for water and you know the your suburban chase, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us a little bit about you know you you've got a special event coming up, but tell us a little bit about run for water and the purpose and and, and why you started it and what you what you've been doing. Sure, um, so. I guess to kind of tell the, the, the full story, I was, I'm an educator. And so, you know, I teach high school, high school biology and environmental science. And so I've always talked to my students about the water crisis, you know, and the fact that we have this limited resource on earth and we don't need to contaminate it. And then also the fact that 
you know, there's a humanitarian water crisis. And um, early on, um, I think it was 2005 or 2006, before I even started doing ultras, I, I told some of my students one day a story about I had a survival situation back in 1996 on the Appalachian Trail. When I, that was the year I graduated college. Whenever I graduated college, I was going to hike the entire Appalachian Trail. So a buddy of mine and I, we, we went out and hiked the uh, section through the Smoky Mountains over Christmas break of 96. And they called it the Blizzard of 96. And it, it believe it or not, I don't know if you know where Derek Knob is, kind of a little south of Cleanman's Dome. It put down five feet of snow on the North Carolina side that came in from oh. North Carolina. I remember getting the forecast for Knoxville. We, I live in Middle Tennessee. And, and it was like, you know, maybe it was still calling for like six inches of snow. But, you know, we were young. We were like, oh, that'll be fine. That'll be cool. and Enjoy the snow in the mountains. And we were stuck there for five days. And it three of those days, it didn't get above zero. Not freezing, but zero. I mean, it had a 20-degree sleeping bag. Um, school started back. I couldn't make it back to school on time. This was before cell phones. You know, people thought we were dead. I mean, you know, they knew the weather was bad up there. They actually sent a Black Hawk helicopter from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, looking for us. Um, we ended up, after we ran out of food and we were super dehydrated because it was so cold, we couldn't, our fuel and our stoves was out and couldn't eat snow because you're shaking and freezing. We made some homemade snowshoes and hiked out to Townsend or to Tremont there on the way to Townsend. And... The next day I went and proposed to my girlfriend and I was like, I ain't hiking that place and drill. I'm, I, you know, so that was kind of one of those, those like sad dreams. I was just telling my students that story and my students came up and they said, you know, Coach Armstrong, we want to hike that place and trail. I was like, no, you don't. You have no clue what you're talking about. And it's sort of been like maybe in the fall. And I was like, okay. I was like, if you want to, if you think you want to hike it, we're going to do three test hikes. We're going to go out. And I was, I was in good shape then. I was still, I was doing, you know, Ironman races and I, I abused these young, young men. I mean, and I look back on it and I'm like, man, that was terrible. We get up at like 4 a.m. in the morning. One, one time we went to Fiery Gizzard and we hiked there and back. Like we did 26 miles. Oh like, yeah. You did the whole out and back. Yeah. The whole out and back of the day. I mean, these kids were, some of them were crying. I'm like, Hey, if you can't handle this, you can't handle the AT. And so I whittled it down to four of them, four of them. I mean, that we would train. They weren't doing sports, but we'd come in and work out in the weight room. Cause I did, if I, I said, if we're going to, if we're going to do this trail, I'm not, we're not going out and doing 10, 15 miles a day. I'm, I mean, if I'm going to leave my family for a week and we, we would go out like during breaks or whatever and do, we, I would, I would have those kids averaging 30. I think we averaged between 30 and 35 miles a day. And I, and of course they Greg were young. Greg started his own last man no standing kidding. out there. I know. I, and I would just, I would, I was the only one with a map and I would kind of fudge the numbers a little bit. I was like, guys, we just got two more miles. You can do two more miles. It's really be like six. And they didn't know the difference. <laughs> and so I knew that, I knew that whenever we went out, I wanted them to think about a purpose that they could do it. And they are like, coach Armstrong, you're always talking about the water crisis. Let's, let's hike for water let's raise money to do a well in africa i was like great and so they raised like two thousand dollars to do this well to go to another organization and when they were sophomores this was this this is how run for water started when they were sophomores they said you know that was so cool coach armstrong the fact that we were able to raise money and we saw this picture of this well they said but you know we want to actually do it ourselves so you know if you're an educator and you got students that want to go you know and so like it started with them me wanting to provide that opportunity for my students. So I started getting educated. We went to some workshops on how to build sterilization systems. Um, you know, the, and, and so I had two, two, two young men that they built this. Um, this was back before you could buy really anything at Home Depot. They built this um, ozone um, sterilization system. They actually yeah. got an award and we went to New York and they got presented with this award. It's super cool. Um, but at that point, Run for Water was just like I'd do an event to raise money just for one system in Honduras because we were going once a year. And then after we got into it a little bit more, I started doing, you know, two trips a year. And then it just it's just been beautiful for it to grow just really slow. Now we're I'm probably taking six or seven trips, 
globally a year. And um, a lot of people don't realize that we there's a significant water crisis, humanitarian water crisis in our own state. I take students to Appalachia once a month. Uh, we go to Appalachia, the poorest county. Well, depending on what statistic you look at, but Hancock County is one of the poorest counties in our state. It's right up north of Morristown and Rogersville, mm -hmm. um, right where Tennessee, uh, Kentucky and Virginia meet. And I mean, there's kids, I, I mean, an hour and a half from where y'all are setting that are drinking water from a contaminated creek or contaminated wells. Multiple families don't even have running water in their homes. So they're going mm -hmm. out and collecting water and bringing it back. So I would say out of run for water, easily 75% of our labor is done in the state of Tennessee doing water projects and water systems for Tennesseans in Appalachia. Um, it's probably funding wise, you know, it's probably not as, I'd say 50% or less, you know, goes to Tennessee. But, you know, as far as the time, we do a lot here in our own state. And then um, right now we're really active in Uganda, Tanzania, in Nicaragua. Uh, we were doing a lot of trips to Haiti, but you know, some of their political unrest is, is just not, it's not, a, not really feasible there. I've got a survey trip to Mexico um, actually next weekend to look at some water systems and then possibly Guatemala. So yeah, it's just, uh, just that's our that's our mission is to raise awareness about the water crisis in the world, um, but also provide solutions. How did you how did you learn all of this as far as, you know, as far as like water filtration and, the, and are you doing wells? Is that kind of what. So how did you learn all that? Yeah, it, it's just really gradual. I mean, early on, it was it was interesting. Early on, we we our main thing was water sterilization. We would put in water sterilization systems at a school or the house where they had contaminated water. We still do that some. Now it's a little bit more, you know, you might say trying to look at the sustainability of a system and then what, because it has to do with, uh, you know, education. Like in Nicaragua, for instance, really poor communities, but every community has electricity. So that's kind of a game changer. Usually we'll do a big tower in the middle of a little village and do gravity fed to filling stations throughout the community. Whereas if you go into rural Uganda or Tanzania, there's no electricity. So you're still doing the hand pump traditional wells. Um, actually, the school where I teach, I raised money to drill a well at our school. I brought back a pump from Uganda. So now I can train students on how to repair this well. And so <laughs> we'll do a lot of, you know, and it's, it's so much engineering and math that they have to figure out. But it's also just good working skills, working with your hands. So I teach my students how to repair these wells, and then we'll go to Uganda and Tanzania to do well repair. That's probably where our niche in Africa is well repair. We will drill some wells just, you know, from time to time. And then, you know, like the initiative that we're looking to do on Kilimanjaro is a solar powered pump, which we've done quite a few of those. So there's just, and then, you know, when there's a new, what I love about it is I'll take my students We'll identify a problem, and then we come back, and in my classroom, we problem solve. So that's a lot of it is me learning, you know, with my students and challenging them to do different projects. For instance, I had a senior last year, Maddie Parrish, who's run. She was at the Stinger. That She was one of those. I don't know if you saw the young girl. She did eight yes. miles, her first ultra. I remember. I well, remember. She just graduated her capstone senior project was to design a bucket uh, sterilization system for fluoride. So fl the water in Tanzania is highly contaminated with fluoride, which mm. uh, it's only one of the only places in the world because of the volcanic mountains. And, um, and so she, and it's, it's like, like she knows more about the chemistry of that than I do. Like she had to do all this research. It took her a, like six months to do the research and then test it with, you know, like test the water before and after. And we went and installed that system last October at a school. So the kids won't have fluorosis, which is fluoride poisoning. And mm. then actually her and her mom summited Kilimanjaro after we installed her water system. So that was super cool. That is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Fluoride can be pretty lethal, can it? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, I think in America, like the it's maybe 
three parts per million. Yeah. That, but like this in this water is testing 40 parts per million. And Ooh. this this is a well that we drilled, but the closest water source was six miles away. Like were, here, were they drink were they, I guess did they have any choice or were they trying yeah. to drink that? Oh, they had to drink it. And you start to see mm. it in the, the children will have like striations on their teeth. That's the first stages of it. And then it just starts to affect your bones. And so I mean it's just and That's it's a dissolved solid, so technically you can't filter it. So you have to introduce it to some component like a bone char that has a positive charge. And then Florida has a negative charge where it'll attach to that. And then you can filter what it attaches to. And so, I mean, it's like, you know, it's pretty, pretty in depth. Um, I'm probably going to ask you a question you may not be able to answer, but I'm going to ask it just because I want to know. But and if, if you can't answer it, no big deal. It may be too generic of a question to answer, but. Is there a, like for donation wise, what kind of money are we looking at just to like install one pump with everything that you need to get one small community water? Sure. So typically if you, if you're going to do a new well system, you know, we have it, it and it, there's a range. Usually it depends on, cause you know, we'll contract out the actual drilling of the well to a, a well, a well rig that, you know, we'll source something in Uganda or Tanzania. Um, and then our team will come in and install the pump. Um, if you're looking at a manual pump, the ticket price of that is somewhere between seven and 10 grand is a, is an average. Sometimes it can be, I think the most we've ever paid in Africa was 15, but the well rig had to travel like a hundred miles and the gas for that. And it's in this really rural mountain village. Uh, but you know, around, I guess on average eight to nine thousand um, dollars. Again, our bread and butter though is well repair. What I know, what I love about that is because if a well pump is, and this is my soft criticism of other, you know, um, water organizations, um, they're all doing great things, and so it's just a very soft criticism because it's interesting. I, it's easy, almost easier for me to do a big fundraiser for a well, a new well project for this community because. You know, a church loves to have this this new project that's going on. Um, but what we like to do more so than actually do new wells is we well repair. Because out of all the, the, the wells in Africa, I would say 50% of them, it's, it's a broken part. And the blessing to that community for $200, I can bless that community. I, you know, it takes special tools and it takes the knowledge on how to repair the well. And that's why I teach my students to do that. Um, but it's the equal blessing of the $10,000 for a new well system. So we yeah. only will do a new well when it is just abs like in this case in Tanzania, the closest water source was six miles. Like these people were wow. traveling six miles one way with their donkeys and carrying the water back to this little village. So obviously they needed a new well. And, and a lot of times we will do that at a school because even though it may be only like two miles from the school, you know, when children are having to walk to get water, they can't go to school. So yeah. uh, obviously there's times that it's just, it's just prudent to do a new well system. So, to, but to repair a well is going to average anywhere between 200 and $500 just because, you know, you're just replacing bearings and chains and rods and plungers and things of that nature. Yeah, it's more labor and or more labor intensive. Yes. I would imagine pulling that pump out and oh, yeah. repairing it. Yeah. So tell us about this upcoming project that you're working on, which I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, never seen anything like this. I'm pretty <laughs> excited to hear more about it too. But tell tell us, you know, how this came about and what what you're what you're planning in May. Sure. So, um, kind of my dream with the starting Run for Water to begin with is. You know, I teach a lot with my students, just the intersection of the humanitarian water crisis and also the environmental water crisis and how they actually overlap, you know, because if we don't take care of, you know, our natural resource of water, eventually humans and especially, you know, the, the you know, the people that are struggling with poverty, they're the, they're, the, they're the ones that suffer the most. And so what I love about this project in Tanzania is it's a great intersection between you know, kind of a environmental water project, but also a humanitarian. So I've been able to summit K 
Kilimanjaro twice. And both times I've just been incredibly impressed with the community of the porters and just the what they do to help us, you know, Americans or Europeans or Canadians um, get to the top of, of this mountain. And, you know, their service is just absolutely incredible. Sometimes they don't have the best gear. And so, you know, and like, I remember when I first uh, summited in 2019, I was in, I was just coming off that race I talked about in Desert Solstice. So I was in really good shape. I couldn't, I couldn't hang with the porters, even in low altitude. It wasn't just altitude. They were just, they could bomb the downhills with a 40 pound backpack and a, you know, a duffel bag balanced on their head. It was just, I would, it was blowing my mind, just their athleticism. And, and then they, they just run up and down this mountain constantly. And so um, part of this event is to feature not only their athleticism, but they're just incredible community and just how patient they are at helping people summit the mountain. Um, the last summit that I did, I started when I was going up to base camp, base camps around 15,000 feet. As I'm coming up to base camp, I see some of the porters running down from base camp. I'm like, where are they going? And then I start seeing them carrying five gallon jugs of water, which is, you know, five gallons of water raised about 40 pounds. Yeah. And it, it's in a, it's in like a bucket or a jug, which is not super easy to carry. So they're carrying on their shoulder and they're going from around 12,000 feet back up to 15,000 feet. Mm. So I, and then I started, you know, doing some research and talking to some of the rangers so any water, any water that a climber uses, drinks for washing, for cooking rice or whatever, that is above 12,000 feet, that is carried on the backs of these individuals to get, to help people get to the summit. And so they're already just, you know, labor intensive job of carrying all the tents and all the, because whenever you summit Kilimanjaro, it's similar, similar to like your Sherpas, you know, on Everest they're carrying the majority of the gear because the likelihood of you summiting is directly proportional to the amount of weight that you're carrying on your back. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a lot of climb, you know, if you're not acclimated, it's going to be, so, you know, all you carry is just maybe half a liter of water and a little snack and a rain, a rain jacket. And then they're, they're going up and setting up your meals and all of those things. So they're working to get, they're already working incredibly hard to help you to get to the summit. And then they have to run back down to 12,000 feet and carry these jugs of water. And I, and I just remember sitting there at base camp and they would come around, they called it washy washy. It's time for you to wash your hands and people turn on the spigot and they're just letting water run out on the ground while they're washing their hands. And, and it, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. Nobody realizes where the water, like the sacrifice that was made for that water to get up there so that you could wash your hands. And I'm thinking, no, I'm just going to use some hand sanitizer because, you know, our team of 11, we probably wasted while we were at base camp an entire five gallon bucket, just washing our hands, not to mention the coffee and the tea and what was used for rice and for our own consumption. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that yeah. was on the back of somebody. And so our, our goal you know, and I, I want to be transparent. I, I'm a, you know, we have to do a huge collaboration with the park service. Uh, I went back in last May and I actually went to survey a stream with the parks ecologist. I met with the commissioner of conservation and everybody is on board for this project, but there's an incredible amount of red tape, you know, with the government to be able to, so I'm not 100% sure that we're going to be able to actually do the water project on the mountain. Um, I, I do believe that we've raised enough awareness, and I actually made a pretty lengthy proposal to the Park Service about how it could be done. And so um, my hope is, is if we can partner with the Park Service to get it done, great. But if, you know, I think they're going to get it done. My point is, I think that I was we were able to share with them, you know, maybe the technology of how it can be done with the number of solar panels and the type of pump and all those kind of things. And so I'm optimistic because at the end of the day, I, it's not about running for water. It's about helping the porters. Uh, but our event in May, which is, is connected to the water. We're looking at, um, 
you know, getting some ultra runners, some elite ultra runners to actually summit the mountain with a group of porters that are maybe the some of the porters that are a little bit more in the realm of ultra running or runners and kind of build that sense of community and like we have in the ultra ultra running community. Um, and then when we after we summit and everybody is fully acclimated the next day, do a race type event, we're looking at probably doing a 12 hour out and back course so that you have this camaraderie and you cannot, you know, and so kind of my goal is for these elite ultra runners to be able to give testimony to what these porters are doing on a daily basis with no accolades. You know, yeah. I mean, we, you yeah. know, all of us ultra running community, we value and we appreciate and we admire, you know, feats of endurance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of, it's humbling to me. There's people out there all around our globe that are doing that every single day as their job. Yeah. You know, it's part of their normal life. Yeah, exactly. I, I'll never forget. I was in um, Nicaragua. I don't speak very good Spanish, but I was in a small community and I could tell this lady, she was motioning for me to come over, wanted to show me something. And uh, I didn't have my translator. So I was like, I'll be back. She's, and she was just super insistent. She took me to her back backyard behind her little, little um, house. And her husband appeared down this hole. Her husband was 35 feet in the ground with a three foot hole with a hammer and a chisel busting through rock with a nine pound hammer and a chisel busting through rock and his nine-year-old kid had a bucket with a rope he would fill that that bucket full of rock and pull it up this man had dug 35 feet in his backyard to get water for his family i ran and got my translator and she said can you please help my husband all we have to eat is tortillas and salt that's all he eats all day and he's he's work he's been doing this for i don't know how long um trying to get our family water and i'm just thinking and this is incredible feat of endurance that this man is doing with limited resources um you know and, and and that's just so that part of the event is to raise awareness of just what incredible community and what these porters are doing and then also just to highlight the water needs you know possibly elsewhere in tanzania where we're working in the savannah in the you know where the fluoride and all of those problems are well makes you realize what you take for granted yeah every day that you do have yeah, for sure. A th did you say 35 feet deep, oh, three foot I, wide? I, I can't. I mean, it, it still blows my mind. And here's the, here's the crazy part, David. Like he, like it, and he's trying to get it done before the rainy season. Okay. But imagine, you know, Nicaragua is a dry season, rainy season. He's digging 35 feet down. Um, what she was asking for was block and mortar. Because if they can't come in before the rainy season and build block and mortar, and this would be like a traditional biblical well, like you would see that just mm -hmm. comes up. Yeah. If they can't get the resources for block and mortar before the rainy season, guess what's going to happen? It's, it's going to erode and just yeah. be contaminated and it's going to fill back in. And they didn't have, he's just going through faith. And then he was just going to like, he didn't even have, but he was that desperate and it was, I think it ended up being like $175 for block and mortar for him to have a legit well. I went back there, this was probably six years ago. I always visit that, that home if, I, if, I, if I'm in that area of Nicaragua. And, and they're so appreciative, $175. And it just was the, and that, that's why I do what I do because for us, it's just such a, it's such a small, you know, amount, but it yeah. is water changes everything. I mean, it just, it, it's an essential element, right? Well, it, it brings up the point too of like, may, that, you know, regardless of you think you can make a small impact or a big impact, it, it doesn't matter. Right. If you impact one person and you change their life like you did on just that one occasion, the rest of it doesn't matter. That that alone was worth it for what you did for that one family. And like, that's the thing that, you know, people sometimes get hesitant on is like, I can't really make a big impact. Right. If you just change one person's yeah. life, that is, 
the impact that, you know, it doesn't matter that that is the most important thing you set, you help save that family. Like you help them. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine how long it took him to dig that hole. Oh, I, it's yeah. <laughs> Did you just have a shovel? Well, the first probably 10 feet is more dirt, but it's hard. Like it's hard dirt. Like I've done, I've dug a lot of holes and trenches in Nicaragua. It's not like, I mean, it's, it's still mixed with rock. And then you get, I don't know exactly when he was just getting just solid rock. He's just chiseling through <laughs> solid rock with a, with a hammer and a chisel. His son probably had biceps for days okay, pulling that yeah. bucket out of there. Yeah. That, that's probably, Jack. So when you went back, they already had, they had it all, you know, put back together. They had the well going and it was still, oh, yeah. you know, like maintained well. Yep. Well, and that, that's another project my students do because their traditional method of getting water out of the well is lowering a bucket on a rope and yeah. then pulling that bucket up. They flip it around. Well, whenever they take that bucket and they set it out on the ground, you know, with where chickens and pigs and dogs have been, and then they put it back, they're contaminating their water source a little bit. Yeah. And so uh, my students also build these really inexpensive. I think they, we can build one for like in country, usually like 25, 30 bucks PVC uh, pumps, which is super cool because I'll, ha I'll challenge my students each year who can build the best pump, the most efficient pump for the cheapest amount. And that all they can use is what they can find at Home Depot or at a, at, you know, like I give them a list of things that you can only get in country. So they have to be able to build this pump with what they can get at a hardware store in Nicaragua. And then we'll cover the well and we put a pump in. So they, they all, they just do this motion and it, yeah. it just, it, it, it's still not probably water we would want to drink, but it is helping it to get less contaminated um, by doing that. Yeah, that's incredible. So what is, what is the goal now for, like what is what are you what are you trying to raise? Uh, yeah. Have you got a target dollar amount you're trying to raise for yeah, this? It's a one it's event? a pretty significant event as far as we're we're hoping because a big part of Run for Water is providing solutions, but a lot of it is telling the story, right? Is just mm -hmm. getting that word out. So we're hoping to to put together a documentary, and so I'm working with a documentary team, um, and um, we're really looking for you know, our big goal is to have some corporate sponsorship so that we can, you know, kind of really get, because I mean, our, I think our budget for the entire project was around $150,000 with everything that we're trying to accomplish on the mountain. Um, but, you know, obviously any, any donation helps to get it to that, to get it to that point. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. What, uh, so where can people go to donate? Yeah. Well, um, on our website, which I think maybe we can provide a link later. There's a there's absolutely. Paper. We'll put we'll put the link on the podcast on social media, and we'll send it uh, through when we send out our monthly newsletter. We'll put it in there too. Okay, um, I guess PayPal or Venmo. I would both. We have a PayPal and a Venmo, whichever is more convenient for folks. I think those are probably the easiest methods to to donate. And if they could. You know, if you, they want to put like the Tanzania project, that way, make sure it's allocated to that. Um, That's awesome. That particular campaign. And then, uh, when you're, are you? Do you have any other projects that you've got going on right now before this one that you're raising yeah. raising money for as well? Yeah, I'm really yes, I'm I'm super super jazzed. Next Friday, I'll go to the mountains of um, Mexico to we're going to be looking at it's where the monarch butterflies migrate over the winter time um and so like there's these there's a really poor there's poor community there that they do have they definitely have some water needs but it's a it's a perfect example this really poor community is dependent upon the trees for their fuel and for you know and so they're going to cut down the trees because they're desperate to have the trees but if they cut down the trees the monarchs don't have a place to migrate and so it's really hurting the the, my, the um, monarch population. So we're going to be looking at some sustainable options to try to bring in possibly even um, some kind of ecotourism to this really poor community. Um, I'm partnering with um, a gentleman from Canada that I met 
through Harvey Lewis, who who actually ran from Quebec all the way to the monarch, the path of the monarch migration, all the way to the mountains of Mexico and ran through our hometown. And he did a presentation at our school about the monarchs. And so we actually have a monarch conservancy at our school that we're raising them and trying to create a habitat for them. So, um, and since he's an ultra runner, I'm an ultra runner. We're looking to survey for an actual race in, we're looking at like March the 9th of this year. So that may be something that we could, that would be available for people to go. It's only two hours um, south of Mexico City to oh, come. Wow. And, th- and this is when the monarchs wake up to make their huge migration north. So again, this is a survey trip next weekend over Labor Day weekend. But our ultimate goal there is to create an event to where, you know, people can sign up and come experience this amazing culture. And it's very rural in the mountains of Mexico. And then um, do do some ministry maybe to help the poor communities there. And then it culminates with the end at the, that Saturday in some type of race. I don't, it probably wouldn't be an ultra. We're probably looking at something a little bit smaller, but um, yeah. So that's, we're super excited about, about that project. And then Nicaragua, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at going to Guatemala to a volcano to look at some um, water water needs there. So, yeah, we've just got a lot of different projects ongoing. Man, that's, that's, all, that's you know, I, good. I've always enjoyed getting to talk to you. And I know that you've, you know, you've ran, run for water for a long time. I didn't know the whole story. And I think it's pretty cool that your daughter, daughter also runs, mm-hmm. you know, a nonprofit as well. And you can give her a shout out here in a minute about what yeah. the work she's doing. But, uh, I just love the fact of how much you have grown this and, and what you're doing. And, it's, it's a labor of love, you know, I mean, that's a lot of labor, um, yeah. but it's pretty amazing, Greg. We'll, uh, what we're going to do is going ahead and I believe John Harden's already done this, but for the East coast adventure events that are coming up, the dirt circuit and gone loco, we're going to add an option to where you can donate, uh, directly to run for water. And then we'll make sure Greg gets that money. So hundred percent of those donations will, will go to run for water. So if you want to donate there, or in John Harden's races, you could do that as well. But we'll also share the link that uh, Greg gives us as well so that you can go directly to his page or PayPal or Venmo and donate. Um, but also give your daughter uh, a shout yeah. out too, because she's doing some pretty amazing work. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, that's that's actually become just an amazing ministry where my first trip to Africa, I was able to take my 15-year-old daughter with me and because you know, they always try to take my family with me as much as possible. And of course, I'm surveying these communities, looking for the water needs. And, and it was became pretty obvious that the burden of collecting water fell on women and children, especially your, you know, preteen, early teen girls. And so my daughter connected and made friends with these, you know, these, these, these young girls in Uganda and started asking them what are some of their, you know, real needs. And the, the girls shared like, well, you know, we miss school once a month uh, because we don't have proper feminine hygiene products. And of course, Mm -hmm. that just lit a fire under my daughter. She came back and told her classmates. And so we started this organization called 84 Days, which 84 Days is the number of days that a young girl or woman will miss work or school if she doesn't have proper feminine hygiene. And, And obviously, you know, as an educator, if I have a, if I have a student that misses a week of school, they get behind. It takes them three, four, three, four weeks to get caught up. Well, that young girl's going to miss another week. Right. Yeah. And so that org- it's called 84 days, 84 days.net is the website. If anybody wants to check it out, but um, we have developed kits. So we have uh, reusable pads that they, we teach them how to clean. We also put a menstrual cup in the kit. Uh, so that's a, a more sustainable option for them. About four or five years ago, we added self-defense because a lot of these girls that are going out to get, um, collect water early in the morning, you know, at risk getting attacked. We just came back from a trip in in Uganda in May, where we, it's a border town between Kenya and Uganda, Busia, uh, Uganda, which is, you know, any border towns usually a little more vulnerable with, um, you know, attacks and safety. And out of the, I think it was 40% of the girls that we introduced the program to a year prior had to use the self-defense to avoid an attack. 
Mm. So, I mean, that's that's become, and it's it's just such a powerful ministry. And, and it's one of those, the two, that I can't, it's a ministry I can't do. So I take my students or my, da- my daughter will train girls here in my class. And then those juniors and seniors in high school or maybe some college girls, they train themselves and then they go put on this program and talk to these girls about their dignity and their worth and their and it's it's all about empowering them and and helping to reduce that gender inequality that is so prevalent across our globe that's amazing yeah. and she started that when she was 15 mm-hmm. along with a lot of her friends it was just it was kind of a collective effort yeah that dude that's 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 awesome i'm i would imagine as a father you're extremely proud of that <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's uh that's amazing well greg I got to ask you a question now that we ask everybody on this, on this podcast. Um, and this is, goes back to a little bit of running and, and I don't know if we, we didn't take many questions for this one since it was, so so you get, you get lucky. You don't have to worry about participant (laughs) questions today. Um, but we always ask, you know, everybody on the podcast, just very simple question because we just love, you know, I mean, this is obviously a running podcast. Um, but why, like, why did you get into running? What keeps you motivated to do it? Like sleeping at a stop sign and a 300 mile race looking like a homeless person. Um, uh, I mean, what keeps you going? Why do you do it? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I tell my students all the time that, you know, running has just blessed my life in so many ways. I, you know, just the discipline and it, it bleeds into every aspect for me. I'm, a, I'm an individual of faith. And so it's a, it's a time where I can, you know, pray and meditate and, you know, and I, I just believe that we are created to do hard things, you know, and I think just the empowerment that comes from that. Um, but I also believe that, you know, using something that we're passionate about, like running, you know, running for a purpose that's greater than ourselves. That's a big part of it for me. Um, but, you know, initially early on, even in ultra running, you know, it was about the podium. It was about qualifying for the U.S. team, and it's it, and it's still about that. But now that I'm getting older, maybe I'm a little bit more sentimental. I don't know. Um, man, it's the relationships. It's the connections. You know, and just the connecting of the dots, right? Like I think back of, you know, Harvey Harvey Lewis and I met when I was on the 2015 team. Well, if and then we've his uh, Frank um, Franklin Baker used to live in Cincinnati. And so like through Harvey, I kind of got to know Franklin. We did a running trip to Nicaragua one time. Well, Franklin knew Isaac. Isaac used to live in the U S and he was an ultra runner here. Right. And so Isaac moved back to Tanzania. If it wasn't for me knowing Harvey, I wouldn't have known Franklin. If I didn't know Franklin, I wouldn't know Isaac. If I didn't know Isaac, I never would have been able to climb Kilimanjaro or do the water ministry, you know, just to see, You know, I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think there's some connections there. And so this the community is what I've learned is it's kind of like I thought that it was blessing my life in this way. But, you know, and and I look back on those races at Vol State where, you know, Johan and I were just like back and forth. And then, you know, but that just builds that deep camaraderie when you when you suffer with someone like that. So, yeah, I know that was a lot. But, yeah, there's no. I, that that's an amazing answer. And it, it is amazing to just like you said, like connect the dots of how people you meet people and how it impacts your life later on when you don't even realize the people that you're meeting. And we've all mm-hmm. been affected in that way, some way or another. Um, because like you said, in the very beginning, the ultra running community is, I mean, it, it almost feels like a large family in a way, you know, it's the camaraderie that you get from this community is, is no, there's no other thing like it. Um, and you know, that's pretty special. And I think that's why the sport continues to grow. And even as it grows, that's still happening, you know, and that's the thing that I love the most is like, sometimes when the sport grows, you may lose some of that, but it just feels like it's only getting stronger. And, and, you know, and you've got such, we had a girl on the podcast, uh, last, you know, this past week, she's, she's ran her first hundred miler when she was 16. She's finished bad water twice. She's 19, you know? And like, that is amazing. Like, 
someone has influenced her to do this. And like now she's going to influence even younger kids yeah. to do this. And like, that's what's so cool. And that's what she said was it's the ultra running community. I got hooked. I feel like I belong here. I fit in, you know, and to hear a 16 year old say that is awesome because yeah. you know, like that's sometimes you don't ever feel like you belong anywhere, whether you're 16 mm -hmm. or you're 40. Yeah do ultra running like you know even yeah. if you don't even if you're not a runner volunteer you will find your family you know you yeah. will find people you get along with and i just i encourage that so much and and what's kind of cool is like you've taken it even a step further because like you've built a community now for run for water and you know like that community continues to grow and you're doing amazing things with it and it's and it's only helped you with knowing these people in the sport so that's kind of cool to see how oh, all these yeah. connections are made yeah uh, sure. yeah and franklin you know I, I don't know franklin that well but i've heard he's a pretty awesome guy uh, oh, hey. and uh, you know most people know harvey yeah. so it's it's just cool that's it's amazing to hear and see and and you've been in the sport for many years now so you've built you know i, I remember my first race when I, I first met you i was like who's this guy and they're like it's greg armstrong i'm like who's greg armstrong <laughs> you know and like you know, and people were just like telling me your story and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then, you know, me and you got to talk some in that race and, you know, and, and we've kind of stayed connected some since then. And you helped me with my first track race. So it's <laughs> kind of, you know, it, it all gets paid back and that's, what's really cool. It's like everybody helps everybody. Yeah, for uh, sure. One, one more question for, from me and Matt may have a question or two he wants to ask you, but, uh, nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> always, always love your take on this. And yeah. I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this mm -hmm. podcast haven't heard it, but you, you are very unique in your nutrition and the fact that you kind of, you kind of do your own thing, mm -hmm. um, for the most part. So what, what's your current nutrition of choice <laughs> and hydration? What are you doing? Yeah. Well, and I haven't always been that way. I mean, I used to, you know, early on, I think with, just like most people, I would kind of geek out on, I felt like I had to have this or had to have that, but, um, I'd say ball state, it breaks that because, and, and you know, you know, you, and especially ball state breaks first, a lot. right. Well, it was 2014, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't the plethora of dollar general stores. And some of these were like mom and pop gas stations. And so, I mean, I, and I did, you know, and I performed well with Skittles, Pringles, payday bars i mean that was it i mean that's and and water and maybe some gatorade like and i and i learned that i didn't need the fancy gel or this i mean you, you need calories and, and and i'm a i'm a minimalist and a utilitarian yeah. by nature right that's just how i am that's how i try to do you know just there's so many aspects i mean i'm driving a 1993 broke down suburban just because that the the driver door doesn't work i have to get in the passenger door and slide over you know it's just but um but i you know and i like to think about like you know my some of my students we went to nicaragua and they were like coach we need electrolytes it's 100 degrees outside we're and, and they're working with these other nicaraguans there's no electrolytes in nicaragua you can't go to the store and buy electrolytes and so i'm kind of giving them this lesson I'm like okay what do you think caveman did you know, they get salt, you get it from your food. You can get a, and so I'm a science teacher. So I'm kind of, you know, and that's kind of their running joke. They're like, yeah, caveman didn't have electrolytes. So we don't get electrolytes. So <laughs> you're getting electrolytes. You're just getting it from the salt or the, you know, and so again, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have any specific trend right now, but, you know, I think, you know, the, the Cairo syrup, it actually wasn't mm -hmm. Cairo syrup. It was just the Kroger cheap brand corn syrup that I would yeah. put a little salt in and then, but if, and if you look at the nutrition, it's the same as a typical jail, you know, that you would eat. And then you're, you know, you get a little salt, you got your sodium, you got your carbs, but it's like a fraction of the price. Did, I just, did you, you know, uh, did you mix peanut butter and like olive oil or anything in there? Or did oh, you yeah. just do straight well, up K have, corn syrup and salt? Well, I had k -Row syrup and just saw it like that would be kind of like my jail where I just wanted a shot of sugar energy. Then I have another mixture that I do on these like long, you know, like if you're doing a long backpacking trip, you want calorie dense food. That's what I would do for Barkley. I would mix in almond butter, olive oil, and honey. 
and salt and sometimes just mush up a banana in there and then like and then you have this kind of it's thin enough to put it in like a like a flask or whatever yeah and then you know you're getting you know a ton of calories you get your fats your proteins your carbs all in one shot and then and it's relatively inexpensive it's pretty smart yeah <laughs> how many times did you have to experiment to get that mixture oh, right? a lot a lot <laughs> There's been many, so I, we won't talk about my failed uh, nutrition <laughs> there's been a lot of those you know so yeah i would imagine you could make a gut bomb pretty quick oh, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> well greg matt you got any questions I don't got any questions. Uh, I just want to say the first time I met you was at Vol St or at a uh, Mid State, I think the second year, and mm -hmm. you had showed up, and I don't think you were planning to run, and nope. then they were talking to you, and they gave you, they gave you one of these, and yeah. uh, you ran for I don't know what eighty miles or something, um, yeah, and I was like, I never saw this dude before, but I watched the video. Uh, from the year before with you and Chad mm -hmm. going, I'm like, this dude's pretty awesome. And then from then on, you know, you start learning your history and you're like, oh, this dude's a baller. He's, he can run forever. So <laughs> it was just cool to meet you then. And then the second time was when we went back la the, the, set, the third year and the guy that was crewing me won the 5K, the run for water 5K mm -hmm. right before. And you handed him those uh, custom, I think, leather. I think that's what he got. Yeah. So that's pretty yeah. cool. He still holds those today, and he still brags like I got no. these. From Greg. I got these. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah uh, Greg, was it the custom trek poles or just custom leather? No, I knew like you were doing custom trek for, poles for a little yeah. while too. Weren't you? That's what I did. You know, I did black toe that first year, and I, you know, that little rock fence you go over. I don't know. I may not be the same course. There's a little rock fence that you had to climb over. I snapped my hundred fifty dollar black diamond, and I was so ticked off. And that was the year I was doing Barkley. And I'm like, I'm not paying that. So I went out. I live on a big farm on the Cumberland River. So I went down to the river bottom. And I thought, well, I'm going to train with these river cane, you know, um, trek poles. And I, if they break. And I, I went to Barkley with them. And I'm like, okay, if they break, no big deal. They don't cost anything. I'll have some re replacements. I'm not kidding. This pair, I don't think I have them in here with me right now. I think they're in my truck right now. But I have, I probably have 350. 400 Barkley miles, like training. I mean, I, cause I'd go out there. I mean, I, I'd go out there almost every weekend when I was getting ready for Barkley rugged miles and they're still holding up. It's the same ones that I did mid state in. <laughs> yeah. I remember them. Years, right. And so, um, yeah, I started making those kind of as custom gifts for different people or for, I think, I think John, I think I've made John Harden a pair and I think I, he had some, you know, I made some for some of his, events but um yeah i like to make i'm you know again kind of that minimalist i love to make my own gear if possible i bet we could auction off a pair of those oh yeah <laughs> raise some money for run for yeah. water sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's pre that's pretty cool i remember those trek poles that was awesome mm -hmm. uh, well greg you got any questions for us no i really appreciate the time guys it's always always good to catch up um and i appreciate the interest in the nonprofit. It mean, means a lot that you have that interest and took the time to, to learn more about it and to get that out to your viewers. Absolutely. And that all goes back to the same thing. It's this community. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, um, guys, we will share the link to donate, to run for water. Um, it'll be in the, all of the podcast release in the notes, and then we'll share it on social media and we'll send it out in the email. Um, please donate and help, help Greg raise some money and we'll, uh, hopefully see a documentary as well of some elite runners and, yeah. and probably a new water source at some point. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's the but goal. Greg, th thank you so much for, for what you've helped do in this community. Cause you're, you're a big part of it. You know, you and Harvey both, um, you know, I mean, y'all been, y'all been in this for a long time and, and it was, you know, kind of watching you guys when I was younger was kind of cool and fun to see when I first got into this sport and, uh, you know, I'm still fairly new, but I, I 
loved watching you guys and it was fun. And then, you know, getting to run those miles with you at mid state, um, it's just really cool to see. And then learning all of this stuff that you have done outside of running and, you know, learning you were a school teacher and all that. And, and I literally just learned you were a cross country coach in this, yeah. <laughs> in this podcast. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, but you know, the run for water and then your daughter's organization, 84 days, it's just amazing. And, and so cool to see how much you're giving back to not just the sport, but just to people in general trying to help. And, and I hope that this community will help you with, you know, donations and to help you further this even more. So thank you for what you do. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Greg, we're going to give you uh, the rest of your night back. Thank you for <laughs> being on the podcast. If you don't care, hang on just a minute after we end, we'll talk for just a second, but thank you so much for your time, Greg. Thanks, of Greg. course. Thank you.